just by way of further introduction to myself, I'm one of the bad guys. I'm one of the guys that designs and put to get, puts together food factories. And we all know that the problems about listeria, we've been hearing now all day, and I imagine yesterday, I wasn't there yesterday, but I imagine that you were hearing yesterday that the problem is always the way the factory is designed or built. So I'm one of the bad guys. And for a number of years, I have been trying to tell other people how to design food factories and food processing equipment based on two documents called um, numbered 14159, uh, the Hygienic Design of Equipment, and 10049, the PRPs for um, HACCP particularly. And I have this 15 minutes this afternoon is a work in progress because I think that actually we haven't got things quite right. As I said, I've been basically using those two programs, but I've be begun to realize that uh, there is more needed than just that in order to be defeating Listeria. Yeah. Um, and basically where, where, where we started with um, those uh, design of equipment and design of um, facilities is the whole concept of, of hygienic design, which is the factory siting and construction, design of the building structure, selection of surface finishes, segregation of work areas, flow of raw materials and product, people, and the design of the process equipment itself, and then the services that go with it. So that constitutes the hygienic design. How we use it um, depends on hygienic processes. From an engineering point of view, there are three of them. Uh, the cleaning and disinfection program, which I'm not talking about, uh, and the maintenance program, and finally, good manufacturing practice. So based on 14159, 10049, and the work of organizations like eHedge, we could put together what we thought was a fairly good program for um, safe food processing. But in certain respects, we're really beginning to have, we, we're beginning to rethink what we are doing, and I've been rethinking all day. Uh, we used to work simply talking about product contact surfaces, easy enough. Non-contact surfaces, easy enough. And splash areas. Splash areas were anything that the product could jump out of the tank and uh, land on the floor or on the side of the tank, that was a splash area. Now we have to think really in terms of areas that are near the product contact surfaces. The non um, product contact surface areas with close proximity as also being an area that we need to be watching. Uh, and so that is getting us into a new, bit of a new rethink on, on the whole question of hygienic design in that, as I say, we've got to look at all the areas. Um, and the way I like to look at things is to consider a section in a factory, a factory, a section in a factory, a piece of equipment as constituting a possible barrier. And we've then got to remember that anything that crosses our barrier, so we draw an imaginary line around the area we're dealing with, and we say anything that crosses that area is a possible source of contamination. Air, water, cleaning chemicals, personnel, packaging, anything that crosses into our room, into our machinery, raw materials, important one, uh, machinery, the machinery when it goes in there is a source of contamination, tools and spares when they go into the processing area, a source of contamination, etc. Now you notice I haven't yet mentioned pests there because we're actually going to keep the pests out of the processing area. Um, so there are other things, but just to remember that what crosses into our processing area is a source of contamination. And we've got to remove 
that contamination within the processing area if we haven't removed it at the barrier. If we have managed to filter um, anything um, harmful out of the air, well and good, then we've got it, what going in is clean. Similarly with the water, similarly with, with any other item there. We try and make sure that the personnel going into the area go in with washed boots, clean clothes, washed hands, etc. So um, we concentrate on the barriers for contamination at all parts of the process. And these barriers could be, I've listed them there, the factory gate is the first barrier. We're keeping out people that we don't want within our factory. Um, at the door, we've got another screening process to make sure that people aren't getting in. We designate which areas people can go into in a specific part of the factory, our zoning. And the zoning is incredibly important. Um, then we've got a barrier at the machine interface. And this, I think, could be one of the ones that is going to be of quite a lot of interest as we go forward um, in investigations now. When I say the machine interface, there could be our pipelines and, and other parts of the process. Now, this assumes that the pipeline joints and unions that we put on pipelines are um, impervious, that nothing can get in there. But that is actually not true. And the pipeline unions uh, that we have been using in a lot of our, our food beverage processing plants for the last 40 or 50 years are in fact not of a high enough, a high quality standard, the so-called DIN unions of which there are millions and millions in this country. So we're gonna, that's one place we're going to have to look at. Um, and then the final barrier is um, the package. Uh, thinking about that, I thought not to put up on the screen the, um, some of the checklists I've got from 14159 or 10049, the GMA facility design um, uh, headings are far more uh, detailed, give us form, far more of an idea of, of, of what we should be doing. and. Particularly there, I want to, I'm not, this is not, I'm not going to go into all of them, but the distinct hygienic zones established for each facility, I think that's important. And the um, standard actually asks that you have that properly mapped out. And I think that is the first thing we've got to do is map out exactly um, what zones we have, how we're dealing with them, and, and where they are within the factory. Uh, the rest of that is it's fairly normal sort of things, water accumulation, airflow. Um, these you will find in, in any of the standards, the sort of things we should be looking at. Um, in the um, equipment, once again, fairly normal sort of things. There are more detail given here than I think in our 14159 standard we have in this country, which is in any case getting on for, I think it's about 14 years old now. Um, so needing some, some update. Uh, but all these things being um, important there, and particularly when we get to the issue of no niches. Um, because once again, a lot of the union types and pipe welding types that we use do not leave us with, ap with um, they do leave us with niches that can be a problem later on. Uh, so just to look at a few things to watch, I've mentioned and we've heard a lot about separation of areas, uh, foot baths, uh, as far as I'm concerned all foot baths must go. They are simply a way of making sure that you get anything uh, coming in distributed equally across the factory. <laughs> hand wash stations, you cannot have enough hand wash stations in any facility. Plenty of them. Pre-pasteurization and post-pasteurization cleaning must be separated. If you are running a um, 
this would apply to the dairy industry and, and um, all the liquid food um, beverage industries. Separating pre-pasteurization and post-pasteurization cleaning and CIP. Having a, second, a se separate CIP station for post-pasteurization to make sure there's no chance of um, contamination. Separating raw material and product storage. Strip curtains, almost as bad as foot baths. Uh, um, liquid on the floor, e.g. centrifuge discharges, should not be running across the floor. It should be right in the drain. Uh, conveyor belts, something that needs, needs um, a lot of attention, because, particularly from a maintenance point of view. And then I've put in something which I don't think is in any of the standards, and I think this is important. We all know about our glass policy. Have we got a crack policy? Do we, know, do we have a maintenance team going around the factory and saying, hey, there's a new crack here, and what are we doing about it? And while we're talking about cracks, in the construction of the factory, have we constructed the factory in such a way that there are as few places as possible where there are going to be cracks? Because if there are less cracks in the factory, there's less need to go with um, microbiological testing because you're going to be needing, we're hearing this morning, microbiological testing wherever there's a crack. Yes, please? So if we limit the number of cracks, just think what that's going to save us in money. Um, because we want to deal only in flat, um, flat surfaces. Overhead structures, we've got a permanent fight going on with the civil engineering industry. They are getting better and better at designing buildings with less and less steel in the girders. And the way they do this is by making the girders that go across the roof, um, hold the roof up more and more complex in their structures. And they become more and more difficult to clean. In the good old days, we just had an I-beam up there. We could get up, we could clean an I-beam occasionally. But these structures they're putting on these modern buildings, they tell us they're using 40% less steel. Sure, but there's 40% more cleaning chemicals going in there. Um, and then just one that, that came up while I was thinking about it, because it was, there was a, um, a slide on the screen sometime this morning, and that is welding, no buck welding, please. And welds must be complete. It's a continuous fight we have with the stainless steel people because if you put too much weld on stainless steel, the stainless steel warps. So we've got to go on and on asking for that one. Um, some cases, I think we've seen most of these, these cases. Three people died, the Whittier Farms pasteurized milk. Contamination was found in a floor drain in the finished product area. I'm not been told that, but I suspect the drain was running in the wrong direction. I'm not going to talk about Jensen Farms. We've heard all about that, but the water pooled on the floor. It was all the things in construction that we shouldn't be having. Cheese, um, roof in the plant leaked, standing water near the cheese vats. Once again, engineers are the bad boys. Um, Milk storage tanks were not properly capped. So those are typical things. And I just want to end with a nice slide to show what I mean when I say we segregate areas. That's the foot over bench in the facility I was going through to inspect all the areas of that particular facility where they're in fact doing low acid foods. And you will notice that there is my name is on the boots wrapped there. I was going from one area of the factory to another. There's my new boots, new coat, new mop cap, all ready for me, sorted out. And those boots were actually gray on the bottom. I was wearing a pair of blue boots when I got, blue soled boots when I got there, a pair of gray boots for the next area. And that's what I mean about segregation of areas. Summary. Um, it's very important in maintaining safety in all instances, absolutely essential in combating of listeria.
and guidelines must be followed.